All right, good morning. We are beginning today with the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, Book 5, Chapter 16. Beginning with Mahishasura himself. Finally, after the deaths of many of his underlings, going himself out to confront the Devi. Vyasa said, O Raja, hearing those words, uh, the challenge of the Devi to him, the Raja Mahisha in anger addressed his charioteer, Daruka, bring over my chariot quickly. That chariot is drawn by 1,000 excellent horses, is bedecked with banners, flags, and ensigns, is furnished with various arms and weapons, and is endowed with good wheels of a white color and beautiful poles in which the yoke is fixed. The charioteer brought the chariot instantly and duly informed the Raja, O oh, Raja, I have got the chariot ready at your door, your beautiful chariot bedecked with beautiful carpets and various arms and weapons. Hearing that the chariot had been brought, Mahisha thought the Devi um, might not care for him, seeing him ugly faced with a pair of horns and therefore decided to assume a human shape and then go to the battle. The beauty and cleverness are the delights of women, he thought. Therefore, I will go before her with a beautiful body and with all cleverness and dexterities. For I will never be delighted with anything but that woman looking at me with fondness and becoming passionately attached to me. Thus thinking, the powerful Raja of the Asuras quitted his buffalo appearance and assumed a beautiful humanoid shape. He put on beautiful ornaments, arm plates, etc., and wore divine cloths, and had probably literally divine cloths, since he has uh, sacked and occupied Amaravati, the city of Indra, and had garlands on his neck, and thus shone like a second Kandarpa, the god of love. Taking then all the arrows and weapons, he mounted on the chariot, and attended by his army, went to the Devi, elated with power and vanity. The Devi blew her conch shell when she saw Mah Mahishasura, the lord of the Danavas, come before her with a handsome appearance, tending to captivate the minds of mistresses and surrounded by many powerful and valiant warriors. The Raja of the Asuras heard the blow of the conch shell, wondrous to all. He came up before the Devi and smilingly spoke to her thus, O Devi, whatever person there exists in this world, this wheel of sansara, be he or she a man or a woman, everyone always hankers after pleasure or happiness. And that pleasure is derived in this world by the combination of persons with each other, Never is it seen where this combination is absent. Again, this combination is of various kinds. I will mention them here. Union is of various kinds, according as it arises out of affection or out of natural consequences. Of these, I will now speak of unions coming out of affection, as far as my understanding goes. The union that comes between father, mother, and their sons arises out of affection. It is therefore good. The union between brother and brother is middling for mutual interests of give, and of give and take are there between the two. In fact, that union is considered as excellent, which leads to happiness of the best sort, and that union which leads to lesser happiness is known as mediocre. The union amongst the sailors coming from distant lands is known as natural, rather than out of, or circumstantial, perhaps, rather than out of affection. They know each other because they're sailing together. They come on various errands concerning their varied interests. This combination, because it offers the least amount of happiness, is considered as worst. The best union leads in this world to the best happiness. O beloved, the constant union of men and women of the same age is considered as par excellence, for it gives happiness of the very best sort. Both the parties, men and women, are elevated when they want to excel each other in their family connections, qualities, beauty, cleverness, dress, humility, and propriety of conduct. Therefore, O oh dear, if you establish with me that conjugal relation, you will get, no doubt, all the excellent happiness. Especially, I will assume different forms at my mere will. All the divine jewels and precious things that I have acquired after defeating Indra and the other devas in battle and others are lying in my palace. You can enjoy all of them as my queen consort, or you can make a charity of them as you like. O oh, beautiful one, I am your servant. Consequently, at your word, I will no doubt quit my enmity with the devas. I will do anything that leads to your pleasure and happiness. O oh, sweet speaking one, O oh, large eyed one, my heart is enchanted very much with your beauty. I will therefore do as you order me. O oh, one having broad hips, I am much distressed 
I now take refuge unto you. O oh, one with beautiful thighs, I am very much struck with the arrows of Kama, and I am greatly discomfited, therefore save me. To protect one who has come under one's refuge is the best of all virtues. O oh, one of a somewhat whitish body, O oh, one having a slender waist, I will spend the remaining portion of my life in serving you as your obedient servant. Never will I act contrary to your orders, even to the risk of my life. Take this as literally true, and do accordingly. I now throw aside all my weapons before your feet, O large-eyed one. I am greatly distressed by the arrows of Kama. Dost thou therefore show thy mercy on me, O beautiful one? Never did I show weakness to Brahma and the other devas, but today I acknowledge my weakness before you. I have defeated Brahma and others. They are fully acquainted with my prowess on the battlefield, but, O honored woman, though I am so powerful, I now acknowledge myself as your servant. You had better look at me and grant your mercy. Vyasa said, O Raja, Mahisha, the lord of the Daityas, having said thus, that beautiful Bhagavati laughed loudly and spoke smiling. The Devi said, I do not desire any other, uh, any, uh, uh, anybody other than the Supreme One. O Asura, I am his willpower. I therefore create all these worlds. I am his Shiva. Uh, uh, Shiva with a long second vowel, the, uh, the feminine form of the name, his Shiva Prakriti, his auspicious nature, that universal soul is seeing me, uh, or, or is the only one who can see me. It is owing to his proximity that I am appearing as the eternal consciousness manifesting itself as this cosmos. As irons move owing to the proximity of magnets, I too, though inert, owing to his proximity, work consciously. I do not desire to enjoy, um, and of course, likewise, is also true that, um, that Shiva is inert without the combination with Shakti. I do not desire to enjoy ordinary pleasures. You are very dull and stupid. There is no doubt in this when you desire sexual union, for women are considered as chains to hold men in bondage. Men bound up by iron chains can obtain freedom at any time, but when they are fastened by, comparatively, but when they are fastened by women, they can never obtain freedom. Oh, stupid one, you now want to serve the source of urine, etc. In other words, the physical body. Take refuge under peace. Peace will lead you to happiness. Great pain arises from connection with women. You know this. Then why are you deluded? Better avoid your enmity with the devas and roam over the world anywhere you like. Or if you desire to live, go to Patala or fight with me. Know for certain that I am stronger than you. O Danava, the devas collected have sent me here. I tell you this truly. I am satisfied with you by your words of friendship. Therefore dost thou fly away while you are living. See, when words are uttered seven times amongst each other, friendship is established between saints. That has been done so amongst us. So there is friendship now between you and me. I won't take your life. O hero, if you desire to die, then fight me gladly. O powerful one, I will no doubt kill you. Vyasa said, O Raja, hearing the Bhagavati's words, the Dhanava, deluded by passion, began to speak. Um, be, uh, further beautiful, sweet words to her. O beautiful one, he said, your body and the several parts thereof are very delicate and beautiful. A mere sight of such a lady makes one enchanted. Therefore, O beautiful faced one, I fear greatly to strike against your body. O lotus eyed one, I have subjugated Hari, Hara, the Lokapalas, and several other devatas. I therefore ask whether it is proper for me to fight with you, O fair one. If you like, marry and worship me, or you can return to your desired place once you have come. You have declared friendship with me. I therefore do not wish to strike any weapons upon you. I have now spoken for your good and welfare. You can gladly go away anywhere you like. O beautiful one, you are a fair woman with beautiful eyes. What fame shall I earn by killing you? A one of slender waist? Murdering a woman, a child, or a Brahmin certainly makes the murderer liable to suffer the consequences thereof. I will certainly carry you today to my place without killing you. If I use force upon you, I will not get happiness, for in such cases the application of force does not lead to happiness. O one having good hair, I salute before you and speak that a man cannot be happy without the lotus face of a woman. Similarly, a woman cannot be happy without a man's lotus face. Where comes off the good combination between these two, then the highest pitch of happiness is conceived, and pain arises on the disjunction thereof. True that you are well decked with ornaments all over your body, but you seem wanting in cleverness. 
for you are not worshiping me. Who has advised you to renounce enjoyments? O sweet speaking one, if this be true, then surely he is your enemy. He has deceived you. O dear, leave this, your stubbornness, and marry me. Both of us shall then be happy. Vishnu shines well with Kamala. Brahma looks splendid with Savitri. Rudra is well associated with Parvati and Indra with Shachi, so I will shine well with you. There is no doubt in this. No woman can ever be happy without a good husband. And why are you not then acknowledging me your husband, even when you have got him? O oh, beloved, where is now that Kama of dull intellect? Why is he not troubling you with his maddening delicate five arrows? O oh, fair one, I think that Madhana out of his pity to you, seeing that you are very weak, is not striking his arrows upon you as he has done to me. O oh, one looking askance, or it may be that I have got some enmity with that Kama, else why is he not shooting his arrows at you? Or my enemies the Devas have advised, the Kama Deva, not to shoot his arrows on you. O oh, one of slender body, as Mandodri had to marry afterwards when she became passionate, a hypocrite, and so she had to repent, thinking that she had not married a, a beautiful and auspicious king. So I think, O oh one, having eyes like the young of a deer, you too will have to repent like her if you decline to marry me now. Here ends the 16th chapter of the fifth book in the conversation between the Devi and Mahishasura in Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, the Mahapuranam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 17. Vyasa said, O Raja, hearing thus the Devi asked the Dhanava, Who is that Mandodari? Who is that king who was not first taken by her, and who is that king whom she married afterwards? And how did she repent afterwards? Describe all these in detail to me. Thus asked by the Devi, Mahisha began to say, O Devi, there is a place named um, Singhala, noted in this earth and decorated with various trees, and prosperous with wealth and grains. Um, Singhala is um, today better known by the name Sri Lanka. Um, it, it is still today also called Singhala. Uh, the, its language is Singhala and its people call themselves the Singhala people. A virtuous Raja named Chandrasena used to reign there. He was calm, peaceful, truthful, heroic, charitable, steady, forbearing, well-versed in politics, ethics, and morals, vast as a wide ocean, learned in shastras, knowing all forms of religions and much skilled in archery. He was mindful in governing his subjects, and he used to punish according to the laws of justice. The king had a beautiful, well-qualified wife, very handsome and broad-hipped. She was very much devoted to her husband and always engaged in religious acts and of good conduct. This wife, endowed with all auspicious signs, gave birth to a beautiful daughter in her first delivery. The Raja Chandrasena, the father, was very pleased to have this beautiful daughter and gladly called her by the name of Mandodari. His daughter began to grow daily like the waxing moon. When she grew 10 years old, she became very handsome. The Raja now became anxious to have a suitable bridegroom and used to think of it every day. The Brahmins then told the Raja that there was a prince named Kambugriva, the intelligent son of the powerful Raja Sudhanva of Madra. This prince was endowed with all kingly qualifications and versed in all knowledge and was therefore a fit match for your daughter, they told him. The Raja then asked his dear qualified wife, um, told her that he would like to marry his daughter to Kambugriva and asked her her opinion. The queen, hearing this, um, asked her daughter Mandodri about it, told her that her father was desiring to marry her to Kambugriva, the son of the Raja of Madra. Hearing her mother's words, Mandodri spoke thus, O oh, mother, I have got no desire to marry. I will not accept any husband. I will take the vow of leading a chaste virgin life and thus pass the rest of my life. O oh, mother, there is nothing more miserable in this ocean of, of, of the world than dependence on another. I therefore prefer to lead incessantly a life of severe asceticism. The pundits versed in the Shastra say that taking up the vow of separateness and independence leads to salvation. I will thus be liberated. I have no need for a husband. At the time of a marriage ceremony, one has to say before the consecrated fire that one will remain always a dependent to one's husband in every way. Besides, in a father-in-law's house, one has to pass one's time like a slave, as it were, to one's mother-in-law and to the husband's brothers. Again, one will have to think of oneself as happy when the husband is happy and as unhappy when one's husband is unhappy. This sounds like the worst of all miseries. Again, if the husband marries another woman, then this misery of having a co-wife is extreme. 
O mother, jealousy arises then towards even one's own husband, and therefore suffering is endless. Therefore, what happiness can there be in this dreamlike world, especially with women who are made dependent by nature? O mother, I heard that in days of yore, the religious son of Uttanapada, Uttama, was younger than Dhruva, and yet he became Raja. And the Raja Uttanapada banished his dear wife, solely devoted to her husband, without any cause to the forest. Therefore, women have to suffer such diverse pains while their husbands are living. And if by chance the husband dies, then women get interminable pains. The widowhood becomes the only source of grief and sorrow. Incidentally, um, she has the story of um, Uttanapada's wife slightly wrong here. Um, it's unclear whether uh, Mahishasura is certainly not to be taken as a reliable source, or he might have gotten the story wrong. Also, the child Mandodari might have gotten the story wrong, but she's a bit off on that. Again, if the husband be in foreign lands, women become subjected to the fire of Kama, and then the house becomes an object of more agony. Thus, whether the husband lives or dies, there is no happiness at any time. Thus, according to my opinion, I ought never to accept any husband. The mother then told her husband about, all about what their daughter had said. Mandodari would accept the vow of a lifelong virgin. She had no desire to marry. She had brought forward many faults in a worldly life and thus would perform vows and japams and pass her time alone. She did not yearn after a husband. The Raja, hearing thus, came to know that his daughter had no intention to marry, and so he began to pass his time without giving away his daughter in marriage. Thus the daughter lived in, in her family, protected by her father and mother. Um, by that time, signs of puberty were seen in the body of the daughter. Her comrades requested her repeatedly to select a bridegroom, but she spoke many words of wisdom and did not show any inclination for marriage. Once on an occasion, that beautiful-faced woman went out with her female attendants on a pleasure trip to a garden, beautified with various trees. There, the slender-bodied one began to play and enjoy with her comrades in picking up various flowers and beautiful flowering creepers. Just at that time, the famous Raja of Kosala, the powerful Virasena, came there by chance. Alone he was on his chariot, attended by a few soldiers only. His large army and retinue were coming slowly behind him at some distance. Her comrades then, looking at that Raja from a distance, told Mandod that he, Oh friend, see, somebody strong and beautiful, like a second god of love is coming towards us, mounted on a chariot. Uh, I think some Raja he will be, and we are very lucky that he has come here. While they were with us talking, the Raja arrived there. The Raja... Looking on that blue-colored woman with beautiful eyes, became surprised when getting down from the chariot, asked the maidservant, O oh, gentle one, who is this woman with large eyes? Who is her father? Tell me this without any delay. The attendant, smiling, told him thus, O oh, beautiful-eyed one, pray speak first, who are you? What for have you come here? What do you want to do here? The female attendant thus asking him, the Raja replied, There is a beautiful country named Kosala in this earth. I am the Raja of that place. My name is Virasena. My fourfold army is coming at my will, at my back. I have lost my way and have come here. Know me as the Raja of the country of Kosala. He is indeed very far from home, like a thousand miles away or so, I think, um, and across an ocean. So he clearly is on far travels and on such travels has gotten lost. The female attendant said, O oh, Raja, this lotus-eyed one is the daughter of the Raja Chandrasena. Her name is Mandodari. She has come here in this garden for sporting. Hearing thus the attendant's words, the Raja replied, O oh, Sairindri. Uh, Sairindri means um, like maidservant, essentially. Uh, with, with kind of like a fancy noble upper class type of, maid, type of maidservant. You appear to be smart. Therefore, make the Raja's daughter understand my following words clearly. O sweet-eyed one, I am the Raja, descended from the line of Kakutsta. O fair woman, marry me according to the rules of the Gandharva marriage. O broad-hipped one, I have no other wife. You are a beautiful woman of a good family and of a marriageable age. I therefore would like to marry you. Or, your father may marry you to me according to rules and ceremonies. If so, I will no doubt be your husband as you desire. Um, so it is very much in keeping with the customs at the time for him to 
send a messenger to her to pass on this message, even though he's literally in front of her and she can probably hear him saying this. Um, it still is considered the courtly manners to send a, to deliver it by way of a third party messenger. So that's why he's saying this to her, uh, to her friend and not directly to her. Mahisha said, O oh, Devi, the female attendant, expert in the Kama Shastra, the science of love, hearing the Raja's words, spoke to the daughter smilingly and in sweet words, O Mandodri, a very good-looking, beautiful Raja of the Solar Dynasty has come here. He is very pretty, powerful, and of your age. O beautiful one, the Raja is entirely devoted to you and loves you very much. O large-eyed one, your time of marriage has come, and yet you have not married, rather you are against it. Your father is therefore always very sorry and remorseful. See how many times your father has sighed and told us, O oh, attendants, always serve my daughter and awaken her to this. I try to convince her to want to get married. But you are engaged in tapas and austerities, in hatta dharma. Therefore, we cannot, uh, in other words, um, in hatta dharma literally means like a, like a hard mode of life, but it also refers to that she is constantly practicing hatta yoga. Therefore, we cannot request you on this matter. The Munis have said, to serve the husband is the highest virtue of a woman. O large-eyed one, women get heaven if they serve their husband. Therefore, you had better marry me according to rules and ceremonies. Mandodari said, in, in some of these remarks, you can clearly hear Mahishasura trying to slip in suggestions. Mandodari said, I am not going to marry. Better that I should perform extraordinary tapasya. Oh, girls, go and ask that Raja to desist in his request. Why is he shamelessly looking at me? The female ascendant then said, Oh, Devi, passion is very hard to conquer. Time is also surmountable with difficulty. So know my advice as the medicinal diet and keep my request. And if you do not keep it, surely danger will befall you. Hearing this, Mandodari replied, Oh, attendant, I know whatever is ordained by fate will inevitably come to pass. For the present, I am not going to marry at all. Mahisha said, the female attendant, knowing this, her obstinate view, told the Raja, O oh, Raja, this woman uh, would not like to have a good husband. You would better go wherever you like. The Raja heard this and no longer wanted to marry that woman. And feeling sad and brokenhearted, he went back with his army to Kosala. Here ends the 17th chapter of the fifth skanta on Mandodari, the accounts of Mandodari by Mahishasura in the Mahapuranam Srima Devi Bhagavatam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 18, Mahisha said, O Devi, Mandodari had a sister named Indumati, also unmarried and endowed with all auspicious signs, um, a younger sister. She, in time, also grew up to a marriageable age. The Svayambara assembly, uh, in which the girl chooses her husband from all the men who assemble, seeking her hand, was then called for the marriage of the maiden Indumati. Rajas from various parts came there, and the maiden Indumati selected from among them a beautiful, strong Raja of noble lineage and endowed with all auspicious signs. At that time, by the undescribable power of destiny, Mandodari, seeing the deceitful, cunning, and hypocritical Raja of Madra, became passionate and desired to marry him. That slender woman Mandodari then addressed her father thus, O father, seeing the Raja of Madra in this assembly, I am desirous to marry him, so perform also my marriage ceremony now. When the Raja heard this request from his own daughter in private, he became very glad, since he wanted her to marry and, uh, and had given up on it, and began with promptness to to make preparations for the marriage. He invited the Raja of Madra to his own palace and gave him in marriage his own daughter Mandodari, according to due rites and ceremonies with an abundance of dowry and wealth. The Raja of Madra, Charu Deshna by name, became very glad to marry the beautiful Mandodari and went back with her to his own abode. The Raja Charu Deshna then enjoyed her for a good many days, when one day a maidservant found the Raja in sexual intercourse with another maidservant in a lonely place and divulged this to Mandodari. She, finding the Raja in that state, became angry and rebuked him with a slightly smiling countenance. Again, on another occasion, Mandodari saw the Raja willingly engaged in amusements and sports with an ordinary beautiful woman and became very sorry and thought thus, 
When I saw him in the Swayamvara, I could not recognize him as a cheat. I am deceived by the Thraja. But what a wrong act I have done through delusion. The Thraja is a rogue, and he is totally shameless and has no dislike for contemptible things. It is now too late to repent for him. How can I have any affection for this husband? Fie on my living now. I forsake from this very day all the pleasures with my husband and all other worldly pleasures. And I take recourse now to contentment alone. I have committed a very wrong act that I ought never to have done. Therefore, it causes intense pain to me now. If I commit suicide, then that sin will never forsake me, and I must have to enjoy the consequences thereof. And if I return to my father's house, I will not be happy there, for my companions seeing me thus will no doubt ridicule me. Therefore, it is now advisable for me to avoid all sensuous pleasures, become dispassionate, and remain here patiently and abide by the strange combinations of time. Mahisha said, Thus that woman lamented and remorsed and began to remain there, very much sorrowful and distressed, renouncing thoroughly all the pleasures of the world. O auspicious one, I am the Raja, yet you are showing your dislike for me. Know eventually you too will be passionate and entertain afterwards some illiterate coward. Keep my word even now. It will be, a, in other words, accept my proposal. It will be of great benefit and will serve as a medicinal diet to you, as to all women. In case you do not follow my advice, you will have to meet with extreme pain and misery, certainly. Hearing these words of Mahishasura, the Devi said, You fool, go to the lower worlds or stand up and fight. I will send you and the other, on, other Dhanavas to death and then go away at my pleasure. O oh, demon, I take up my form to preserve the righteous whether they suffer, uh, whenever they suffer pains in this earth. O oh, Lord of the Daityas, formless and birthless am I. Yet at times I take up form and am born to, sir, to save the devas. Know this firmly. O wicked Mahisha, the devas prayed to me for your destruction. Therefore, I will not rest until I kill you. I speak all this truly to you. Therefore, fight or flee to Patala, the rightful abode of the Asuras. I speak truly to you again, that if you do not flee, I will destroy you wholly. Vyasa said, O Raja, hearing these words of the devi, the Dhanava took up his bow and joined the battle, fully stretching the string of his bow back to his ear and began to shoot sharpened arrows with great force at the Devi. The Devi, too, hurled with anger arrows tipped with iron and cut, uh, cut down the Asura's arrows in pieces. The fight between them rose to such a terrible pitch that it caused terror to both the Devas and the Dhanavas, trying hard to be victorious over each other. In the midst of the terrible encounter, the demon Durdhara came up to fight, and made the Devi angry and shot arrows all terribly poisonous and sharpened on stones at her. The Bhagavati then got very angry and hit him hard with sharp arrows. Durdhara struck thus fell down dead on the battlefield like a falling mountain top. The demon Trinetra, well skilled in the uses of arrows and weapons, seeing Durdhara killed, came up to fight and shot at the great goddess seven arrows. Before these arrows came on her, she cut them to pieces with her own sharp arrows, and by her trident, killed Trinetra. Trinetra thus killed, Antaka quickly came in the battlefield and struck violently on the head of the lion with his iron club. The lion killed that powerful Antaka by striking the demon with his nails and out of anger began to eat his flesh. Mahishasura became greatly astonished at the death of these mighty Asuras and began to shoot pointed arrows sharpened on a stone at her. The Devi Ambika cut his arrows in two before they reached her and struck the demon on his breast with her club. That vile Mahishasura, the tormentor of the devas, fell in a swoon under the, under the stroke of the club, but patiently bore it, and, at the next moment, came again and struck the lion on the, he on the head with his club. The lion, um, too, by his nails, rent that great Mahishasura to pieces. Mahishasura then, quitting the man form, which had been torn apart, took up his lion form, since, of course, no male being can kill him, and the lion is a male lion. So if it rents, tears his body apart, he just instantly springs up in another one. Sprang up as a lion, and by his claws cut the Devi's lion and wounded him badly by his nails. On Mahishasura taking up this lion form, the Devi became very angry and began to shoot arrow after arrow at him all very terrible, sharp, like poisonous snakes. Then the Asura, quitting the lion form, assumed the appearance of a male elephant, oozing out juice 
of, of the, the musk from his temples and began to hurl mountaintops with his trunk. Seeing mountain peaks thus hurled on her, she cut them to pieces with her sharp arrows and began to laugh. The Davy's lion, on the other hand, recovering somewhat from having been wounded, sprang on the head of the elephant Mahisha and by his claws tore him to pieces. To kill the Davy's lion then, Mahisha quitted his elephant form and assumed the appearance of a Sharabha beast, more powerful and terrible than, uh, than a lion. The Davy, seeing that Sharabha, became angry and struck on the head of that Sharabha with her axe. The Sharabha too attacked the Davy. Their fight became horrible. Mahishasura then appeared, assumed the, his true form as a buffalo and struck Bhagavati with his horns. That terrible Asura of hideous appearance, swinging his tail, began to attack the thin-bodied Devi. That violent Asura caught hold of the mountain peaks with his tail and whirling them round and round, hurled them on the Devi. That vicious soul then, maddened with his strength, laughed incessantly and addressed her, O Devi, be steady in the battlefield. I will send you today unto death with your youth and beauty too. You are, an, you are an illiterate fellow as you have become maddened to fight with me. Really, you are deluded in your pretensions that you are very strong. This idea of yours is absolutely false. I will kill you first and the hypocrite devas after who want to vanquish me by standing up a woman in their front. The Devi said, O oh, villain, do not boast. Keep yourself firm in the fight. Today I will kill you and make the devas discard their fear. O oh, wretch, you are a sinner. To torment the devas and terrify the munis. Let me have my drink of the sweet decoction of grapes, and then I will slay you undoubtedly. Vyasa said, O Raja, saying thus, the devi, wrathful and eager to kill Mahishasura, took up a golden cup filled with wine and drank again and again. When the devi finished her drink of the sweet grape wine, she pursued him with a trident in her hands to the great joy of all the devas. The devas began to rain showers of flowers on the devi and praised her and shouted victories to her with the playing of the Duntabi drums. Uh, Jay, uh, and shouted, Jay, Jiva, victory, live. The rishis, siddhas, gandharvas, pishachas, uragas, and kinnaras witnessed the battle from the celestial space and became very much delighted. On the other hand, Mahishasura, the hypocrite pundit, uh, began to assume various magic forms and struck the Devi repeatedly. The Devi Chandika then, infuriated and his eyes reddened, pierced violently the breast of that vicious Mahisha with her sharp trident. The demon, struck by this trident, fell senseless on the ground, but got up again in the next moment and kicked the Devi forcibly. That great Asura, thus kicking the Devi, laughed repeatedly and bellowed so loudly that the Devas were all terrified with that noise. Then the Devi held aloft the brilliant discus of a good axle and of a thousand spokes and spoke loudly to the Asura before her. Stupid one, look, this chakra will sever your throat today. Wait a moment. I will send you instantly unto death. Saying this, the Divine Mother hurled the chakra and instantly that weapon severed the Danaba's head from his body. Hot streams of blood gushed out from his neck as the violent streams of water get out from mountains. Colored red with uh, colored red from red sandstones. The headless body of that Asura moved to and fro for a moment and then dropped on the ground. The loud acclamations of victory were sounded to the great joy of the Devas. The very powerful lion began to devour the Asura soldiers that were flying away as if he was very hungry. Oraja, the wicked Mahishasura thus slain, the demons that remained alive were terrified and fled away to Patana. The devas, rishis, human beings, and the other saints on this earth. Um, interestingly, we say the other saints, other than human beings, saints that were not human on the earth. We're all extremely glad at the death of this wicked demon. The Bhagavati Chandika quitted the battlefield and waited in a, lo and waited in a holy place. Um, then the devas came there with a desire to praise and chant hymns to the Devi, the bestower of their happiness. Here ends the 18th chapter of the fifth book on the killing of the Dhanava Mahishasura in Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, a Mahapuranam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 19. O Raja, then Indra and all the devas became very glad to see the great Mahishasura slain. 
they all began to praise and chant hymns to the world mother, Jagadamba. The devas said, it is by thy power, thy shakti, that Brahma becomes able to create this world, Vishnu to preserve and Maheshvara to destroy during the pralaya time of this universe. But when they are bereft of thy shakti, they are quite unable to do such. Therefore, O Devi, thou art undoubtedly the adhikarana, the prime cause in the preservation and destruction of this whole universe. O Devi, thou art in this world, fame, idea, and ideal, memory. Thou art the goal, mercy, compassion, faith, constancy, earth. Thou art Kamala, the mantra Ajapa, respiration and perspiration, nourishment, Jaya, Vijaya. Thou art contentment, correct notion, measure, intellect, Rama, uh, which is the goddess Lakshmi, knowledge, forgiveness, beauty, intelligence. Thou art the Shakti of Rudra, thou art Girija, and the Shakti um, of, the, of the goddess Uma, and all other forces in this universe. This is known to everyone in the, in the three worlds. Without any or all of these shaktis, no one is able to perform any action. Thou art the supreme cause of all this world. Therefore, everything rests on thee. If thou wert not the upholding power, how could Kurma and Ananta have upheld this world if you were not the dharana shakti? Um, so in other words, Kurma and Ananta uphold the world or por portions of the world, but um, she is the force of upholding that they or anyone enacts, the dharana shakti. O mother, wert thou not this earth, could all these world load of things have rested on the sky? O mother, those human beings that worship Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra, Chandra, Agni, Yama, the god of death, Vayu, Ganesha, and the other devas, they are certainly deluded by thy maya. Could all those devas do any action or any favor without thy shakti? O mother, those that offer in any yajna a profuse quantity of ghee as oblations to the several devas are certainly conceived to be a very narrow views. Wert thou not the swaha, could it, not, could it have been possible for those devas to get the offered oblations at that moment? Certainly, therefore, they are fools and ignorant persons. O mother, thou givest the several objects of nourishment and enjoyment to all the beings in this universe by thy parts, the several transformations of these material things. It is thou that nourishest the devas, thy devotees, as well as, um, as, well as the others, the dhanavas, according to their karma. O mother, as the owner of any garden plants, with pleasure, uh, 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 as the owner of any garden, plants with pleasure, beautiful trees in his garden for his delight, and finding some of them not to bear any fruits or leaves or of a bitter taste, does not cut them off by their roots. So, O Devi, thou hast brought into existence these daityas out of their inferior karmas, and thou art supporting them. Knowing that the daityas like to enjoy the celestial nymphs, thou hast out of compassion killed them by your arrows in the battlefield to afford them facilities in their rebirth in heavens, and thus to enjoy the deva women, which they could not have got in any other possible way. Therefore, um, this thy dealings with them are to fulfill their intentions and not to kill them. O mother, it is a great wonder that to kill these asuras thou hadst to assume this divine body. Thou could have done so by thy mere will. It seems that this act of thine is but a mere leela. There is no other cause for this. O Devi, those human beings that do not worship thee in this dreadful uh, Kali Yuga, they are certainly deceived by the cunning Purana makers have who have deluded them to worship Hari and Hara, who are thy creations. Oh, what an amount of evil has befallen to those poor souls, O oh, Devi. Those men know that the Devas, tormented by the Asuras, are thy devotees, and yet they worship them, certainly such fellows, holding lighted torches in their hands, plunge deep into the darkest waterless wells. O oh, Mother, thou art the Vidya, the blissful intelligence, and thou grantest pleasure and liberation. Thou art the avidya, uh, the great delusion, and thus thou causest bondage and pain in this world. O mother, thou only destroyest the affliction of the human beings. Those that want liberation worship thee, and those that are ignorant and attached to worldly enjoyments do not worship thee. What more can be said than this, that Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesha, and the other devas incessantly worship thy adorable lotus feet, but those men that are of dull intellect and are mistaken do not meditate on thy feet, and therefore they must come again and again into this ocean of the world. 
or Chandika. It is through the grace of the dust of thy lotus feet that Brahma, Vishnu, and Maheshvara are creating, preserving, and destroying this universe. Therefore, O goddess, those men that do not serve thee are certainly very unfortunate. O mother of the universe, thou art the goddess of speech of the suras and the asuras. Thus, if thou didst not dwell in their mouths, they would have been un unable to utter a single word. Therefore, O goddess, how can men speak when they are thus deprived of thee? O mother, it is due to the curse of Brigumuni that Hari takes several avatars as Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, Narasingha, um, and, uh, uh, and the Vamana avatars. All these show clearly the dependence of Hari. Uh, how then can they avoid the fear of death when they serve these dependent in incarnations? O oh, mother, it is well known that the uh, male generative organ, the linga of Shambhu, the Mahadeva, fell onto the ground owing to the curse of Brigamuni when he went to the hermitage of the Rishis. How can then happiness come in this world or the next to those who worship such a Shambhu who wears human skulls on his body? O Devi, those that worship Ganesha, born of the above qualified Mahadeva, are awfully mistaken. They are especially quite ignorant of thee, the goddess of the universe, that can be easily worshipped and that can give the fourfold aims of human existence. O Devi, it is out of thy kindness that thou hast slain with thy arrows the enemies, and thus hast translated them into the heavens, otherwise they would have certainly gone down to Naraka, owing to their own karmic effects. Brahma, Hari, Hara, and the other devas cannot realize thy greatness. How can then ordinary men know thee when they are deluded by immeasurably strong Satvarajas and Tamas Gunas. O Mother, those who do not worship thy lotus feet are very hard to be brought within this mind and therefore worship the visible sun and fire. They cannot grasp the essence of the Vedas, demonstrated by hundreds of passages of, of Sruti. They are deluded and simply suffer pains. O Mother, I think that the influences of thy Satvarajas and Tamas Gunas are widely known in this world. Both Gunas, as taught in various looting schools of tantras by various persons, stimulate people to the worship of Vishnu, Maheshwara, Surya, and Ganesha, and thus just detract them from worshiping thee. O mother, those that detract thus the Brahmanas from worshiping thy lotus feet, and advise them through the Agamas to worship Hari, Hara, and others, thou dost not get angry with them, rather dost thou show thy kindness to them and make them widely celebrated, as possessing the occult powers of enchanting, bringing others under their control, or attracting towards them various other persons. Uh, I, I do find it interesting here that even in this, um, this very sectarian passage, they feel the need to acknowledge that their rival sects possess real occult powers, as if that is a, was held a very proven fact and not something that they could even debate. In the Satya Yuga, Satvaguna was more powerful and therefore the untrue Shastras could not rear their heads. But in this Kali Yuga, owing to the sattva guna being not so powerful. The lower gunas have got preponderance. So these so-called clever pundits, instead of worshiping thee, worship Hari Hara and the other devas, the products of their fancy, and hide thee. O mother, thou art the Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of the supreme consciousness. Thou givest liberation to thy devotees when they succeed in their yogas. Therefore the purest sattvic munis meditate on thee and thee alone. Those that get themselves diluted in thee, they are very blessed. What more to speak of them and their praise they will no longer have to suffer any pains uh, by taking birth in wounds. O oh, mother, thou art inherent as Chit Shakti, the power of consciousness in the Supreme Spirit, and therefore he has become manifest especially as this great cosmos and becomes known as the creator, preserver, and destroyer of this world fashioned out of five elements. O oh, Devi, what male can by his own power work out this Jagat Prapancha, enjoy it and move in this without the aid of thy Shakti? O Bhagavati, this universe has been created by thee. Thou art therefore its mother. The 24 essences or tattvas are inert. How can they, without thy chit shakti, create this universe? O Devi, never can these senses and organs endowed with guna and karma do any work or bestow any fruits without thy shakti. O mother, wert thou not svaha, the instrumental cause in the yajna? How could the devas have got their shares of the ghee offered in the yajnas by the munis? Therefore, O Devi, thou art no doubt preserving this universe. O Bhagavati, it is thou that hast created this world in the beginning. It is thou that art preserving the gods Harihara and others. It is thou that art destroying this universe. Therefore, O Brahman, the devas cannot know thy deeds. How can then men who are of dull intellect know thee? O Mother, thou hast now saved the devas by killing this terrible Mahishasura. 
O oh mother, all the Vedas have not been able to know exactly all thy movements. How can we of dull intellect praise thee? O oh mother, thou hast served our cause by killing our enemy, the wicked Dhanava, the inconceivable source of pain to all the world. By this act of thine, thy fame has spread far and wide in this universe. Therefore, O oh thou of renowned prowess, thou art the mother of this world. Save us and maintain us by thy mercy. Vyasa said, O oh Raja, the devas having praised the Devi thus, the Devi addressed them gently. O oh devas, say if you have any other difficult thing for me to do. Remember me whenever any difficult crisis occurs to you. I will destroy that evil. The devas said, O oh Devi, all our purposes have been served when thou hast killed our enemy Mahishas uh, Mahishasura. Now dost thou do for us so that we can always recollect thy lotus feet, and our bhakti be firm and steadfast towards thee. It is only the mother that bears the thousand offenses of the son. We therefore cannot say, why men knowing this do not worship the mother of the universe. There are two birds always dwelling in this body, Jivatma and the Paramatma. They are so very intimate towards each other that they never separate. But there is no other third friend that can bear the faults of these two. Therefore the embodied soul that forsakes thee his friend can never attain any welfare. What more as unto this? That vicious soul is very unlucky amidst the devas and men, no doubt, who denies and renounces the goddess. He who on attaining the excellent human body, attained with much difficulty, does not remember thee frequently by words and deeds, is certainly the vilest of men. O Devi, whether in times of distress or happiness thou art our savior, therefore dost thou protect us with thy best weapons. O Devi, there is no other means of our security than the grace of the dust of thy feet. Vyasa said, O Raja, the devas having prayed to the Devi, thus, the Devi vanished then and there. The devas, seeing the disappearance of the Devi, were struck with surprise. Here ends the 19th chapter of the fifth book on the prayer and hymns to the Devi in Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, the Mahapuranam of 18,000 verses, by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 20, Janamejaya said, to whom Vyasa is speaking, O best of rishis, I have now seen the wonderful excellent deeds of the Devi for the enhancement of peace in this world. Though I have heard from thy lotus face these nectar-like words, still I am not satisfied. O best of munis, what did the chief devas do when the goddess disappeared, kindly say to me? O Bhagavan, I think those jivas cannot fully comprehend those excellent sacred deeds of the Devi that are less fortunate and have done not many mer meritorious deeds in this world. O Muni, what to speak of the less fortunate souls, even the Mahatmas who are well versed in hearing such things can hardly be satiated on hearing the Devi's deeds. O fie to those that do not hear of these things, the essence of essences, on hearing which men become immortals. The mother's leela is to preserve the devas as well as the great munis and to serve as a boat for the human beings to cross this ocean of the world. How can then the grateful souls forsake her? The pundits versed in the Vedas declare that the devi's life is able to fulfill all desires. Therefore, the liberated souls that want liberation, the worldly souls, the diseased, all ought to drink incessantly the nectar-like the nectar -like nectar of devi's doings, especially the rajas that are engaged in dharma, in earning wealth and in enjoyments, ought to hear her, uh, ought to hear her life. O Muni, when the liberated souls drink the nectar-like doings of the Devi, what doubt can there be with ordinary human beings uh, that they should listen with rapt devotion to those wondrous things? O best of Munis, it is those that worship the goddess Bhavani in their previous birth with beautiful kunda flowers, champaka flowers, and bay leaves. Uh, they have, it is to be inferred, in their present births become possessed of rich enjoyments. And those devoid of any devotion that obtained this human body in the land of Bharata and did not worship the mother goddess, they are in their present births without grains and riches, diseased and void of any children. Wander they always as servants carrying out orders and bearing only the burden loads. Day and night they seek for their own selfish ends, yet they cannot, get their, uh, yet they cannot even get meals to fill their belly. Blind, deaf, dumb, lame, and lepers suffer pain and misery on this earth. Seeing them, it should be inferred that in their previous lives, they never worshipped the goddess Bhavani. And those that are wealthy, prosperous, attended by numerous attendants, and are always enjoying like kings, it is to be inferred 
but they certainly worship the lotus feet of the mother goddess in their past lives. Therefore, O son of Satyapati, as you are kind-hearted, kindly narrate before me more excellent deeds of the Devi. O best of Munis, where did the goddess Mahalakshmi, created out of the shaktis of all the gods, depart after she had slain Mahishasura and had been worshipped and praised by the Devas? O highly fortunate one, you told me that she vanished from the sight of the Devas. Now I would like to know, where is she staying now? Whether in the heavens or in the land of mortals? Did she melt away then and there, or did she... Descend, uh, did she uh, ascend to Vaikuntha, or did she go to the mountain Sumeru? Omuni, narrate all these duly before me. Vyasa said, O Raja, I told you before about the beautiful Manidvipa. That island is the place of sport to the Devi and very dear to her. And that place, Brahma Vishnu and Mahadeva were transformed into females. They afterwards became males and were engaged in their respective duties. That place is grand and splendid and is in the center of the ocean of nectar. The Devi Ambika assumes various forms there as she likes, and she sports there. To that Mani Dvipa, the auspicious Devi departed after she had been praised by the Devas. To that place where sports always the eternal Bhagavati Bhuvaneshwari, the incarnation of Parabrahman. When the highest goddess vanished, the Devas installed on the throne of Mahishasura, the powerful Raja Shatrugna endowed with all auspicious qualities, the lord of Ayodhya, and descended from the solar line. After making him thus, the Raja, Indra, and the other devas went to their respective abodes on their own conveyances. conveyances. O Raja, the devas having gone to their places, the subjects were governed on this earth according to dharma, and they passed their times in ease and comfort. It used to rain then timely, but the earth was covered with plenty of grains and wealth. The trees were all filled with fruits and leaves and gave enjoyment to people. The cows, with their udders full like earthen pots, gave such a profuse quantity of milk that men began to milk them whenever they liked, not even sticking to a schedule. The river's waters were all clear and cooling, and they flowed full in regular channels. The birds grouped round, grouped round them. The Brahmanas versed in the Vedas were engaged in performing yagnas. The Kshatriyas observed their virtues and were engaged in doing charities and in their education. Um because there was, there was no war to be fought at the time. The Rajas held their rods of justice and were engaged in governing their subjects. Though the several Rajas were busy with various arms and weapons, they all became fond of peace. The, thus, no wars, no quarrels were seen amongst the subjects, and the mines yielded plenty of wealth to the people. The best of Rajas, there were the Brahmans, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras, who became the devotees of the goddess. The Brahmanas and Kshatriyas used then to perform so many yagnas that at every nook and corner in this globe, the sacrificial altars and the yagna posts became visible. The female sex became gentle and of good behavior, truthful and chaste towards their husbands, respectively. Atheism and unrighteous act vanished entirely from the face of the earth. Indeed, I would, one would expect atheism to vanish from the face of the earth when a, a embodied deity just appeared and everyone witnessed them. <laughs> There's, everyone knows that God exists at the time. The people left all dry discussions. They argued only about the Shastras that did not go in contradistinction to the Vedas. Nobody liked to quarrel with each other. Poverty and evil inclinations were checked. The people everywhere lived in happiness. Untimely death was not there, so the people had no bereavements with their friends. No distress was seen. Famine want of rains, and de deadly plagues were out of sight. The people had no illness even, and jealousies and quarrels vanished. O Raja, all men and women began to sport merrily everywhere like the gods in heaven. Theft, atheism, deceit, vanity, hypocrisy, lustfulness, stupidity, and the anti-Vedic feelings were not to be seen. O Lord of the earth, all humans were then extremely devoted to their dharma and engaged in serving the Brahmanas. The Brahmins were also according to the threefold plan of the creation, Sattvic, Rajasic, and Tamasic. The Sattvic Brahmins were all versed in the Vedas, clever and truthful. They were kind, they controlled their passions, and they did not accept any presents from others, even if offered. Filled with their ideas of dharma, they used to perform their uh, Purodasha and other such yagnas with Sattvic, rice, etc. But never, never did they immolate any animals. Oraja. The Sattvic Brahmanas gave charities, studied the Vedas, and offered yagnas for themselves. These were their three ordained actions. They were busy in these. O Raja, 
the Rajasic Brahmanas were versed in the Vedas and acted as priests to the Kshatriyas and ate flesh as sanctioned by recognized rules. They were busy with their six duties. They offered, so they do the same three duties, the, the, the same three sattvic duties. Um, they offered yagnas on their own behalf, assisted others in yagnas. They took gifts, made charities, studied and taught others the Vedas. The tamasic brahmanas were angry, attached to worldly objects and jealous. They studied very little of the Vedas and spent most of their time in serving kings. Oraja, when Hishasura was killed, all the brahmanas were glad and began to practice dharma according to the Vedas, observed vows and made charities. The kshatriyas began to govern the subjects, the Vaishyas carried on their trading business, and the other tribes went on with their agriculture, preservation of the cows, and lending money on interest. Thus, all humans became very glad on the death of Mahisha. Devoid of cares and anxieties, the subjects got much wealth. The cows were endowed with auspicious signs and gave plenty of milk, and the rivers flowed full of waters. The trees looked splendid with an abundance of fruits. Humans were without diseases. In short, people had no mental agony, and uh, there was neither too much nor too little rain. Shalavas, mice, birds, and seditions uh, were not extant. In other words, um, uh, there were not too many mice or birds like overrunning the fields or granaries or so on. Oraja, beings died not prematurely. Uh, rather, they enjoyed incessantly their full health and possessed lots of riches. Especially beings engaged in the Vedic dharma served the lotus feet of Chandika and thus spent their lives. And here ends the 20th chapter of the fifth book on the peace of the world and the Mahapuranam Srima Devi Bhagavatam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. And that, I think, is a very good place to end at the end of the whole cycle of Mahishasura. And we will uh, get into starting the next story at the beginning of next time. Thank you so much, Theo. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, thanks for coming. Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, Durga drank wine before for her final conquering of Mahishasura. Yes. Cool. Is that something like how when Lakshmi gave Dattatreya wine kind of thing? Like every once in a while, it's cool to drink wine. Even if you're a uh, av Ma avatar or Ma a deity. Oh, yeah. Devi loves alcohol. It's, it shows up all the time. Wow. So, yes, it's always described right. that she she likes to fight while tipsy. Um, so she, she she typically drinks alcohol before fighting, but also like even for example Whoa. in like this isn't even like a like a vamachara tantrika thing like it's just mainstream and all the deity worship not necessarily that the, they'll offer alcohol in temples that's more of a certain tantrics thing but even in basic jhana shlokas of the goddess like in um, Lalita Sahasranama which you know, one of the most common main hymns of praise to the to the Devi that people do in temples and at home all the time. It starts with dhyana shlokas, like most such stotrams, where certain meditation verses to guide you in a visualization. And right there in the dhyana shlokas is that she's holding a cup brimming with mead. It's just like constantly part of the Devi's character. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, now, they mentioned Kali Yuga, this is happening during Kali Yuga when the gods were talking to Durga? Um, they said something about Kali Yuga that. There was a mention of Kali Yuga. Um, the story very clearly does, is not set in Kali Yuga. Um, they, they were rather mentioning that um, people are de during Kali Yuga. Um, is due to the due to the delusive influence of Kali Yuga, is what influences people to deny the goddess and not worship her. Um, wow. But a lot of that passage reads to me like a uh, sectarian interpolation. Um, and I am. It, 
honestly somewhat suspicious that a lot of that was that a, a lot of that was accurately representing the praise of the devas to her at the in the wake of the Mahishasura war um particularly since it does not closely follow the main version of that story from the um, Markandeya Purana of the praise of the devas oh. after the Mahishasura war um really it um a lot of it particularly it gets into claiming the supremacy of the devi's worship over various other sects and um reads to me like a rivalry between pundits oh wow <laughs> definitely a thing that goes on in wow. some of the puranas yeah 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 whoa interesting um so i would i would kind of take the reference to kali yuga to have been made more in that context huh. amazing yeah uh, one more one more quick question uh sure. the uh there was the reference to uh interesting uh the the vice uh lended money on interest and Vaisias, like that was a part of the sat yuga that was like they were talking about utopia and they're like how everything was going great everything was dharmic and yeah. part of it was and I, and, you know, I thought that they uh, it wasn't actually vices it was tribals who they said did that um uh, it was listing the vices went on with their business uh sutras did such and then it said and the other tribes did a few things oh. including lending money on interest so yeah it was referring to that there were some yeah. tribal people lending money on interest yeah yeah i mean it's like so interesting it, you know it presumably not mm -hmm. in a like overly predatory fashion since they were saying that everybody was thriving and doing well so you know people were getting loans right sure they paid interest but it wasn't like an abusive predatory to an extreme it was reasonably regulated but yeah money lending on interest was was practiced in in modern history we are told that the Knights of the Templar uh, started a credit system, uh, the first modern Western credit system, uh, in when they were in Jerusalem during the uh, eleven hundred in the eleven hundreds, the twelfth century. Yeah, and you're like, wow, brilliant! In the twelfth century A.D., they started a credit system. Oh, that's <laughs> so advanced. <laughs> yeah no and india has charge, had and they charge interest or you know why yeah india has had detailed written laws on credit systems and so on for thousands and thousands of years like not even just like huh. references and scriptures like this like detailed economic textbooks on it and stuff like that uh, yeah bruh. wow yeah the the most detailed I mean, like course, something gonna be in the um not in puranas or like you know religious texts which might just mention it, but in the Artha Shastras, um, the, the big one is um, Kautilya Artha Shastra, uh, which is a text on huh. economics. Got whole long, long chapters on credit and interest and such. Like enlightened, the, the enlightened way to run uh, finances. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It was, it was a manual followed by ancient Indian kings. Or at least... I, supposed to be followed by them. He wrote it for the benefit of ancient kings. Yeah. Amazing. So it's about like business and stuff in general, or how would you summarize it otherwise? Um, it's about, e e e e primarily it's about economics. It's, it's a, it's a, t it's basically a, a, like a school economics textbook written for kings and kings advisors. In another um, yuga? No. Um, he, oh. this was early Kali Yuga. It, um, th we know the, historically who authored it. He lived, uh. um, he lived, I think, in the 300s BCE, 400s BCE, right around there. <laughs> he, he was the he was the private advisor to King Chandragupta Maurya. He was a like a <laughs> contemporary of Alexander the Great. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Deva. Yep. This is so fascinating. And thank you, Andy, for asking those questions as well. Yeah. And I have a follow up question about uh, alcohol, Devila. Um, oh, sure. In yeah. terms of, obviously, um, I'm just curious what the scriptures say about drinking alcohol, not necessarily for baby, but for followers of Sanat and them. And, yeah. And yeah. Um, um, there's, so, yeah, I, I, I do know what the scriptures say. Hmm. Um, in Sruti, in the Vedas, um, they don't take a, they don't take in, they don't give instructions. The Vedas in general are not big on giving instructions. They just kind of give advice. There's some quotes. I, I'm actually <laughs> pulling this up right here because I actually I I have written on this before. Um, okay. 
So there, there's a couple passages from the Rig Veda on alcohol that sound anti-alcohol, but they're not giving an instruction. They're just kind of giving advice. Um, <laughs> uh, it says, an action performed as per the inner voice does not lead to sins. Dumb arrogance against the inner voice, however, is a source of frustration and miseries in the same manner as intoxication and gambling destroy us. So that's a reference to intoxication. There's another line in the Rig Veda. <laughs> I've always thought this is funny. Those who consume intoxicants lose their intellect, talk rubbish, get naked, and fight each other. Yeah. Um, again, not it's not saying not permitted or whatever. It's just a, a warning. Um, and <laughs> everyone knows that's all true. That's all stuff that does happen. Not every time, and so on. Um, wow. So in, in the Smriti, hilarious. In the Smritis. Um, so Kataka Sanghita, Manu Smriti, Vishnu Smriti, also Mahabharata, Bhagavata Purana, Brahmanda Purana, all forbid alcohol for Brahmins, but not for everybody else. Um, for example, Vishnu Smriti says um, the 10 intoxicating drinks are unclean for a Brahmana, but a Kshatriya and a Vaishya commit no wrong in drinking them. Um, there is... is it for them to only... Sorry. Is it for that, like, a Kshatriya to only drink it when going into war or just routinely as well? Kshatriyas drink r alcohol routinely all the time. No, um, it was considered, no. because Kshatriyas, what, what was the determiner of Kshatriya was, in, in large part, having a strongly Rajasic nature. Um, they were supposed to be, like, um, good warriors, which means inclined to war. It, you like you're not going to be inclined to war unless Raja says your main guna. So they all ate meat, drank alcohol. That was like the kind of men they were, um, and and women too, uh, very much. Kshatriya women drank wine um, and other alcohol all the time. They were, you know, they were advised to have moderation, and if they were. Um, if they were practicing spiritual sadhana, since it, traditionally kshatriyas as well underwent Vedic studies in an ashram, they wouldn't be drinking alcohol during that phase of their life, eh, during brahmacharya dharma. But once they go into grihastha dharma and so on, normally yeah, they would drink alcohol. Just brahmins wouldn't. Um, or anyone who's interested in practicing yoga or so on might refrain from alcohol, but not just the general population. In ancient wow. Asia. Yeah. Fascinating. Would you mind repeating the first verse or first instruction or not instruction, whatever, from the Rig Veda that you the Rig Veda, yeah. out? Yeah, I, I, it's one that I like, um, not not mainly for its reference to alcohol, but it, um, it said, this is Rig Veda, um, this is Rig Veda Mandala 7, um, uh, chapter 86, shloka 6. An action performed as per the inner voice does not lead to sins. Dumb arrogance against the inner voice, however, is a source of frustration and miseries in the same manner as intoxication and gambling destroy us. That's great. So it's all about intention that they're talking about there. Then the actual in, in, action. Intention, in, intention and being in tune with your inner conscience and your inner sense of mm. what's right rather than like mm -hmm. dumbly going against it because of some surface thought or surface desire that on a deeper level you know isn't right mm. yeah and i'm just thinking from a mental health point of view because in england um addictions are classified under mental health problems i'm not sure about us but here they definitely are yeah yeah and um and i'm thinking and mostly when people do have some sort of addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs or Netflix or whatever, it's usually because, so, so if we take Netflix as an example, so they say, so generally if somebody just watches a TV program because they enjoy it, it gives them pleasure, that's fine in modern life. That's what in my experience in um, helping people if they have an addiction, it's usually because they're watching it to divert them from some unpleasant emotion or yeah. to distract them from something that they don't want to feel. Yeah. Um, and then it turns. So I've took Netflix as a simple kind of daily human example, but I feel I've seen the same thing applied to very serious drugs and alcohol and things. So yeah, that's. I just feel that what you read out kind of. I, I feel like that's what they're speaking to as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Dumb arrogance against the inner voice, trying trying to stifle mm. trying to stifle the inner voice, 
mm. which which is like telling you that there's something that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you guys. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Big, uh, big uh, J uh, Durga, J Durga today. Jay Durga. Yes. 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 Jay Durga. Amazing. Incredible.